Kari Moyang Puja Pantai is the last of the traditional rituals still being practiced by the Ma Meri. According to legends, the ritual appeases the spirits of the sea was started many years ago when a junk ship carrying passengers and goods was caught in a big storm off Pula Keri, near Tanjung Ru, in the Straits of Malacca. None of the islanders thought the ship would survive the storm, but to their surprise, it was dragged to the shore by some unknown force. Villagers believe that spirit of the rubber had saved the ship and its passengers. Each year, the Marmeri tribe on Kerry Island, Klang, celebrates Puja Pantai, or Sea Spirits Day, during the Lunar New Year. Marmeri live close to the sea and are often fishermen. Traditionally known as seafarers, the Marmeri hold the annual event to ask spirits of the sea for protection for their families and nearby community, as well as for a good bounty throughout the year. Upacara ni kita ucap terima kasih lah. Cara apa senang saya cakap cara kampung cakap apa masalah masalah yang kita tak diketahui. Mamere tribes people walking towards a beach through oil palm plantation towards a beach to begin the Hari Muyang Puja Pantai festival to celebrate the spirits of their ancestors. Malaysia's peninsula is home to nearly 200,000 indigenous people consisting of 18 subgroups collectively. Known as the Orang Asli, or original people in the Malay language. Malaysia's peninsula is home to nearly 200,000 indigenous people consisting of 18 subgroups collectively known. As the Orang Asli, or original people in the Malay language, today, there are five Marmera villages, including Kampong Sungai Judah, which is nearest to the sea and the core location for Puja Pantai. Bercerita dengan moyang lah, minta rezeki, menipahkan rezeki, denjang bayang kita, maksud saya biar tubuh, denjang bayang tu bertubuh, kita yang sihat, luar afiat. According to their beliefs, a ship was caught in a big storm off the coast of Kerry Island. The Marmera believe it was saved by a spirit called Muyang Gita. The shaman, along with villagers and musicians, then marched three kilometers towards the beach sporting long grass skirts and wearing carved wooden face masks from the Marmera tribe. Kita berlarak jalan kaki daripada kampung sampai ke Pantai Bangkong ni uh, sejak 3 km dan uh, uh, untuk setahun sekali ya lah, untuk kita mem, ibarat macam bayarlah ibarat kita beli barang kalau kita butuh cukup bulan bayar itu lah maksudnya Various types of food are placed on the platform to be offered to the sea spirits in a thanksgiving ritual called Puja Pantai and villagers also present food offerings at the wooden platform, or sandgar, prepared since the beginning. Ma Mary teenage girls comfortably wear their traditional clothes and a shaman rubs rice powder on the face of a teenage girl as part of the ceremony. <laughs> Dia jemput saya, saya hadirkan sama-sama. Inilah budaya Mak Meri. Orang saya, orang asli Mak Meri. Inilah saya cik. Besok saya, uh, saya besok dah, sekarang saya berumur. Inilah untuk warisan anak saya besok. As the morning twilight approaches in an Indonesian city famed for its street food scene, a queue of sleepy customers snakes its way along the road in anticipation of a local culinary legend. The clock hits 5 a.m. in Yogyakarta, and out of the darkness appears a small and frail sarong-clad woman on the back of a black motorbike. She climbs off slowly, tightly holding a basket that carries the sweet snacks she has been selling for more than half a century. She's been selling lupus for a very long time, since 1963, and nothing has changed. <laughs> 
you tell me, tell me, that's good. That is, we got the double beard on the young boy, or I didn't know that. You're not a new, that, I know, tell it, it's a young man. You're part of the young, you're, you're being hit by some tattoos, so far. We don't got the same thing. Every day, she opens her stall before dawn and hunches over a table to prepare and dish out traditional market snacks. Displayed on a banana leaf is a selection of treats that includes an Indonesian sweet cake known as lupus made from glutinous rice. Alongside the star dish is tea wool, which is made using cassava flour, palm sugar and senil, a worm-shaped tapioca flour jelly. <laughs> Due to her age, Sadnam's stall is now a family affair. Her husband is in charge of the sticky rice. Her son handles the firewood and her daughter drives her to work and accompanies her through the four-hour shift. Asked why she refuses to quit what is usually a young person's game, the enduring street food granny brushes off the question with a laugh. <laughs> The secret to the recipe passed down from her mother is firewood, which gives the sweet dessert a smoky flavor. Saya itu pertama kali ngerasain lupisnya Mbak Satinem itu tahun 80-an, 88 atau 89. Pertama tahu ya dibeliin sama ibu waktu itu. Nah, sampai sekarang ternyata Mbak Satinem masih sehat, masih jualan. Rasa lupisnya juga tetap sama, gurih, pulen, dan gulanya, juruhnya, kalau kata orang Jogja itu kental, enak mas. Customers who have to wait more than an hour to satisfy their sweet tooth come from all corners of Java. The Indonesian island where Yogyakarta sits in the middle, the sweetness and stickiness of the lupus and the thickness of the brown sauce make the cake delicious. She cuts it with a nylon thread, carefully placing it on the banana leaf before dripping thick liquid palm sugar and sprinkling grated coconut over the breakfast fare. Kalau saya sih tadi apa datang jam 6 ya. Tapi di situ antrian nomor 1 sampai 50 udah full. Terus apa saya datang lagi barusan belum saya ta- apa, kurang tahu ini sekarang jam berapa saya dapat amar antrian nomor 22. Ta- tadi pun saya coba tanya ibu-ibu yang dapat antrian nomor 25-an, saya tanya dia udah ngantri dari jam uh, setengah 6. Thailand is renowned for its vibrant street food and luscious tropical fruits, but Ratchan Acorn Sri Kong is on a mission to make a new addition to the menu, cheese. Vivid green rice patties and fruit orchards cover the kingdom's countryside, but dairy accounts for a tiny proportion of agriculture and cheese has not traditionally been part of the Thai diet. Ratchanay Corn is part of a small but growing community of cheesemakers attracting attention from top chefs in Michelin-starred restaurants in the capital Bangkok.
My mother never feed me with cheese when I was young. She feed me with tofu, with rice. Mm. So, so how I connect, I cannot connect with that things. I like a bright painter. I paint very beautiful and say, oh yeah, your cheese is very delicious. But I'm bright. I cannot see my picture. After growing up in rural Thailand eating little dairy, she had to learn from scratch what good cheese should taste like. When she started out some seven years ago, she felt like a blind painter, unable to judge the quality of her work. I like me. And I'm quite nerd. I believe in the, the bacteria. Mm. I make cheese in the corner of a world with the bacteria. I don't work as a food or the, the chef. From a herd of around 30 goats, Rachine corn produces 15 varieties of cheese, some with a local twist, such as coatings of bamboo ash, wild rice, and pandan leaves. The 47-year-old studied cheese-making books and read until I could smell it. But ultimately she found her connection to the punchy flavors of goat's cheese through the pungent, distinctively Thai condiment platak, fermented fish paste. Study hard. I study only uh, even the Michelin water criteria. What what the Michelin talks about? What the criteria? What's the theme of this year? Mm, so my chef had to get the star. I do for you. I study for you. I make a short note lecture everything, and I try to help them buy my cheese. I create a uh, local green thing, carbon zero credit. On her small farm in Nakhon Patham, an hour's drive from Bangkok. Rachine Korn lives in a modest wooden hut, but her herd enjoys a palatial double-story barn under the shade of trees, carefully positioned to catch breezes. Making cheese in Thailand, where the weather is hot and humid almost all year round, is no easy task. I think the, their star, their Michelin star, is mine. You get only three maximum, but I, ten or twenty, I can because you I collect from you everything. <laughs> I think customer, not divide by nation, divide by they love it or not. Mm. I don't care you are Thai or expat. If you love my cheese, you are my special one. Rachine Korn reflects on her challenging early days, describing numerous failures despite initial success. As a passionate science nerd, she embraced the difficulties of working with bacteria, Finally, I don't sell cheese. Now. I, I, there is really some happy or some something for them. Make it, make them smile. After extensive preparation, she personally delivers her cheese to over ten high-end restaurants in Bangkok, including four Michelin-starred ones. Ultimately, she believes that the joy of cheese making lies in making people smile, stating, "Life is good. Cheese makes it better." Every region in the country has its own flavors and ingredients that add nuances to different micro-cuisines, and each cuisine has its own history and legacy. As famous as Indian cuisine is internationally, it is generalized with a few dishes, but the thousands of recipes from Kashmir to Kanyakumari would make an impossible-to-lift cookbook. Butter chicken is prepared with marinated chicken that's first grilled and then served in a rich gravy made with tomato, butter, and a special spice blend as a base. I don't want to reclaim what is meant is ours, there's nothing to reclaim about it. It's already, already ours, well documented, all uh, its historical fact from Government of India's awards to um, Government of India's citations in, the, in their uh, uh, websites. Everything is uh, absolutely clear. There's no reclamation needed. It is ours and we'll ma make sure that it remains ours. I don't... Two Delhi restaurants both claim to have the right to call themselves the home of the original butter chicken recipe the roots of butter chicken, are only as recent as the 1950s, when it was developed accidentally by the chef of famous restaurant Modi Mahal in Delhi, the capital of India. For chef Kundan Lal Gujral, it was a common practice to throw in butter, tomatoes, and leftover tandoori chicken into a pot to make use of the leftovers. 
The butter chicken of Motimel uh, has standards. That's you know it, we we are very proud that my grandfather invented it and uh, it has put Indian cuisine on the world culinary map. And the battle of butter chicken doesn't stop here. From a daba to a fine dining restaurant, butter chicken is a staple in Indian restaurants serving North Indian cuisine, but each restaurant has its own way of cooking it. Moti Mel is personal for Indians. Everybody has a story about Moti Mel. You know, it's a 100 year old, 104 year old chain. Everybody has been, wherever I, in the world I go, because I'm a chef, I kind of teach, I train, I write. And wherever I go, there is some connect. Of course, in India, much more because everybody has heard of it, everybody everybody's visited it, or there must be some connection of their parents being engaged in Motimel, or their parent, or somebody would have had the first date in Motimel. Delhi, arguably the culinary capital of India, owes a large part of its flavor heritage to the Mughals. Butter chicken, however, has far more humble origins, and was born far closer to home. The beauty of butter chicken lies in the subtle balance of tanginess and a velvety texture. It is easy to get wrong, and often the versions you may find are too sweet or way too spicy. For me, I've come from London, and I'm here, uh, it's just been second day, and for me, when I think of butter chicken, I can only think of one place, that's Moti Mahal. I don't know anywhere else. To be honest, my childhood memories, everything relates to Moti Mahal when I think of butter chicken. So the taste is sitting in my mouth, and I'm very happy I've just had it. And that's the best thing, to get a smile on my face. Authenticity is overrated and the best kind of food is that which evolves unapologetic ally, adhering to the basic objective of pleasing the palate. After all, when Kundan Lal Gujral invented butter chicken, little did he know that he was creating history, in a way. And if he had not experimented, the world would not have known tandoori chicken, butter chicken or even dal makhni. I don't think I've eaten this naan and butter chicken like the way the taste here in Moti Mahal is. You know the smell, the fragrance when I walked in the restaurant is reminds me of my childhood memories. And that cannot be taken away from any other place. So I would, I would always be here. The world's wine production dropped 10% last year mostly because of extreme environmental conditions such as droughts and fires, according to a leading industry body. Scientists say climate change driven by greenhouse gas emissions is making extreme weather more frequent and intense. At an experimental vineyard in China's northern region of Ningxia, a researcher delicately unwraps a newly grafted hybrid vine, part of a game plan to combat climate challenges to the country's nascent wine industry. At a laboratory in Beijing, purple and green hybrid species grapes are laid out on a board for testing, part of the strategy China's nascent wine industry is using to try to combat climate challenges. Scientists are using genetics and artificial intelligence to address imperfect weather conditions, as well as anticipate future problems that might be wrought by rising global temperatures. A recent review in Nature highlights that global warming is impacting grape quality and altering the suitability of current wine-growing regions, resulting in both advantages and disadvantages for different areas. In response, many Chinese wineries are focused on adapting to these challenges. 
它的那个果实的生葡萄生长，包括果实的品质，朝着我们所理想、所需要的这种这个方向是发展的。其实我觉得，我认为葡萄品种需要不停的杂交，不停的杂交跟回交，能让它的品质，在它不光在品质会越来越好的同时，把它的就是最早的基本的这些抗性、抗虫、抗病、抗寒、抗旱。这些包括抗盐碱，这些优良的基因能继承下来，这我觉得这是我们杂交的最终的目的。Solutions are sought both in the sterile calm of CAS laboratories and in the dusty fields of wine-producing areas like northern Ningxia. There, temperatures in winter drop so low that vines have to be buried. We want to know if we plant some vineyards in a given position whether. Uh, that position will keep the sustainability uh, in, the, in the context of climate change. So what will happen in the next uh, 10 years, uh, 30 years, or 50 years, or 100 years? So to do that, we have to use uh, a coupling of uh, prediction of climate uh, with the different scenarios, and also with uh, a mathematical modeling uh, work to see what will be the performance of the wine. Rising temperatures are causing grapes to ripen too quickly, leading to high sugar levels and low acidity, creating significant challenges. To address this, and experimenting with new cultivation practices and considering vineyards in cooler areas like mountainous Yunnan and Tibet. Meanwhile, Dai's team in Beijing is using mathematical and climate modeling to predict future sustainable growing regions, aiming to assess the viability of vineyard locations over the next few decades in the face of climate change. This project is propagated in the wine industry. But nowadays, with the challenge of uh, climate change, uh, I think uh, during the last 10 years, even in Europe, they, uh, they changed their mind. They changed their opinion. They start to welcome uh, the interspecies uh, varieties because they have a very high resistance to disease, uh, to drought, to different things. And of course, they maintain a uh, rather uh, high quality. The most ambitious strategies involve developing new hybrid grape varieties that are more resistant to inclement weather. 搞栽培来说，最怕就是气候的不稳定性，就包括啊突然性的降温，包括冰雹天气，包括这种冬季的极极冷天气，都都都都对农业，对尤其对葡萄生产都有很大的危害的。所以基本上葡萄所有的葡萄酒庄最担心、最最困扰的也是这些事情。Each year, the lab has the potential to produce around 20,000 new genotypes through crossbreeding, all of which must be evaluated. Previously this was done manually, but now scientists use AI image recognition software to record aspects like color, shape and size in seconds, cutting the time needed to identify candidates for further cultivation. 他们对我们这个中国自己的品种就北风北面啊，他们尝了我们自己做的酒，看了我们的葡萄园栽培模式，他们信心越来越足，他们觉得这个品种啊，一定能做出具有中国特色的葡萄酒。Chinese winemaking has seen the emergence of registered hybrids like Beihong and Beimei, created by crossing the cold-resistant native vine Vitus amurensis with superior European species. These hybrids can withstand temperatures below minus 20 degrees Celsius, reducing winter-related costs for winemakers like Jiushi. Liang expressed growing confidence in the quality of hybrid grapes, stating they can produce wines with Chinese characteristics. I just want to make a wine that is our unique Chinese character. This is our dream. This is our dream. This is our dream. This is our dream. The West Bengal government has decided to discontinue the service due to challenges posed by the city's traffic. Kolkata's tram system, which has been a part of the city's landscape since 1873, is set to come to an end. The sound of a tram bell in Kolkata brings deep das great joy, symbolizing the significance of the city's historic tram system. When I sit on the tram, I remember my childhood. 
और बचपन में हम लोग ट्राम में बैठते थे एक दो स्टॉपेज पर जाके वो जाने पर उतर जाते थे फिर दूसरी तरफ से आते हुए ट्राम से फिर चढ़ते थे फिर उतर जाते थे तो उसमें क्या था कि ट्राम राइड भी हो जाता था और भाड़ा भी नहीं देना पड़ता था However, despite being cherished by fans as a key part of Kolkata's heritage and growth, the 151-year-old tram network is at risk of disappearing. Kolkata is the only Indian city where trams function today. Introduced in 1983 as horse-drawn carriages, tram cars also ran on steam before switching to electricity in 1902. Initially, Trams had two compartments first class and second class with different fares When I whenever I sit in tram I can see the city through a different view point of view because these wooden frames have a different taste of vision I can see the detail of the city through this uh, tram because it's very nostalgic it's very old and it very beautifully uh, uh, mixes with the surroundings wherever it goes introduced in the sprawling eastern city in 1873 during the early days of the imperial british raj trams in kolkata were initially horse drawn then steam driven electric powered trams took to the streets in 1900 the tram now rumbles on the serpentine roads in the city weaving its way through snarled traffic jams of vintage yellow taxis trucks buses cars and at times cattle and i don't know what's going to be happen in future maybe this is the last tram which i am riding and this will be the last and i cannot see something new other than this whenever i think about it i really feel sad about it that uh, i am riding these trams and one day they all will be scrapped but the next time i think that uh, we can be the change we can do something so let's not lose lose hopes and let's fight for it we can make something better out of it instead of scrapping it These noisy fans and these old seats have lived through two world wars India's independence and modernization. The single story trams painted in uniform stripes of bright blue and white with a sunshine yellow top trundle along at around 20 kilometers per hour at best when they're not stuck in traffic. City ka ya shahar ka vikas hona chahiye saath saath mein purani sanskriti aur sabhyata ko bhi bachaye rakhna chahiye. To ye hamari purani pehchan hai. The state's West Bengal Transport Corporation argues its trams are cheap, safe, produce no noxious fumes and are economical, fitting five times more passengers than a bus, calling them part of the city's glorious past, present and our future. The state feels that only 6% of Kolkata's surface area is roads and trams vying for this space adds to the congestion. definitely so this is the only city in india which has the tramways and if this is removed then this uh, glory of the not only the city the country will be lost